Canto 2, Chapter 3, Text 12, Pure Devotional Service. Gyanam yet ah, this is through the meter. Gyanam yet ah, pratinyanivrita gunormi chakram. That's not the right meter. Gyanam yet ah, pratinyanivrita. Aprati nivrita gunormi chakram. Atma prasada uta yatra guneshva sangaha. Kaivalya samata patas trata bhakti yogaham. O near Vito Harikata Suratim Nakuryat. O near Vito Harikata Suratim Nakuryat. Yanam yet a pratinivrita gunormi chakram. Yanam yet a pratinivrita gunormi chakram. Atma prasada utayatra guneshva sangaha. Kaivalya samata patastrata bhakti yoga. Ko nirvito harikata suratim nakuryat. Transcendental knowledge in relation with the Supreme Lord Hari is. Knowledge resulting in the complete suspension of the waves and whirlpools of the material modes. Such knowledge is self-satisfying due to its being free from the material attachment and being transcendental, it is approved by authorities who could fail to be attracted. Well, we'll find out who's going to be unattractive. It's coming up. Purport by Srila Prabhupada. According to Bhagavad Gita 10.9, the characteristics of pure devotees are wonderful. The complete functional activities of a pure devotee are always engaged in the service of the Lord, and thus the pure devotees exchange feelings of ecstasy between themselves and relish transcendental bliss. This transcendental bliss is experienced even in the stage of devotional practice. Sadhana avastha. If properly undertaken under the guidance of a bona fide spiritual master and in the mature stage, the developed transcendental feelings culminate in realization of the particular relationship with the Lord by which a living entity is originally constituted. Parentheses. Up to the relationship of conjugal love with the Lord, which is estimated to be the highest transcendental bliss. Close parentheses. Thus, bhakti yoga, being the only means of God realization, is called kaivalya. Kaivalya is in this verse. Kaivalya Samata. Kaivalya. Well, here it's word for word is transcendental. Another meaning is absolute or nothing else but Kaivalya. Kaivalya. The only means of realization of God is called Kaivalya. Srila Jiva Goswami quotes the Vedic version. Eko Narayano Devaha Paravaranam Param Aste Kaivalya Sangitaha. In this connection, 
and establishes that Narayana, the personality guide, is known as Kaivalya. And the means which establishes one's approach to the Lord is called Kaivalya Pandha, or the only means of attainment of Godhead. This Kaivalya Pandha begins from Shravana, or hearing those topics that relate to the personality of Godhead, and the natural consequence of hearing such Harikatha is attainment of transcendental knowledge, which causes detachment from all mundane topics for which a devotee has no taste at all. For a devotee, all mundane activities, social and political, become unattractive, and in the mature state, such a devotee becomes uninterested even in his own body, what to speak of bodily relatives in such a state of affairs, when it's not agitated by the waves of the material modes. There are different modes of material nature in all mundane functions in which a common man is very much interested or in which he takes part become unattractive for the devotee. This state of affairs is described here in his Prati Nivrita Gunormi. Prati Nivrita Gunormi. Prati Nivrita. In the first line. Prati Nivrita, completely withdrawn. And guna, urmi, urmi means small waves. Urmi, like urmila. The waves of the material modes, gunormi, and prati nivrita, completely withdrawn. So this state of affairs is described herein as prati nivrita gunormi, and it is possible by atma prasad, or complete self-satisfaction without any material connection. The first class devotee of the Lord attains this state, stage, by devotional service. But, despite his loftiness for the Lord's satisfaction, he may play the voluntary part of a preacher of the Lord's glories and dovetail all into devotional service, even mundane interest, just to give the neophytes a chance to transform mundane interest into transcendental bliss. Srila Rupa Goswami has described this action of the pure devotee as Nirbanda Krishna Sambande Yuktam Vairagya Uchate, even mundane activities dovetailed with the service of the Lord are also calculated to be transcendental or proved Kaivalya affairs. I mean, each one of these purports is really bhafti. And this is just Canto 2. Prabhupada's giving the real deal. So. For starters, the phrase at the very beginning of the Sanskrit of this verse is Gyanam. So there's different concepts and different ways of trying to acquire the means and the, and the object of the means to attain knowledge, transcendental knowledge. So there's, there's mundane knowledge, of course, and then there's transcendental knowledge, of course, and there's approaches to, to try to attain transcendental knowledge. And without, you know, eliminating the ones that are not meant, because this, this chapter is about devotional service, it's the knowledge that comes from devotional service. What's the distinction? Well, and one, one distinction is knowledge that without devotional service, it gives a glimpse of that which is eternal. And one who has a glimpse, or abhas, or shadow, or reflection, or 
all these different terms. It leads to detachment. Jnana Vairagya. It's a couplet within Vedic text, common, common, common. Jnana Vairagya. It's incomplete. That jnana is incomplete. Why? Because it's not resting on something substantial. What does resting on something substantial mean? The 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 living the knowledge of the living entity being quote spirit as opposed to matter or the covering of the soul is incomplete because we're not just spirit, we're part of something that's much bigger. The spark is part of something much bigger. The drop of seawater is part of something much bigger. The individual soul is part of something much bigger. And without understanding that which it is part of, then it's incomplete. It's not resting on something substantial. Substantial has different implications. One of them is sat. But so sat, the this, this soul is eternal. That's true. But how long will that rest? Understanding oneself to be sat. Especially when one is in a material body or in the material atmosphere where the modes of nature are ruling. The living entity is ruled. We're not ruling. <laughs> We're ruled by Prakriti. And Prakriti means modes of nature. So if one has, if one is in the material field and even if the mode of goodness is prominent within that individual, which is rare, but it's, it's certainly possible to come to that stage. There's always the mixing of the modes and competition for the, of, of the mode for supremacy, and sometimes mode of passion predominates, sometimes the mode of ignorance predominates, even for a mode of goodness person. As long as we're in the material atmosphere, the position of Atma Tattva or Brahmagyan is limited because it's not re resting on something substantial. The reality is we are spirit soul, but what, what's that reality connected to? It's part of something much bigger. So without it, it, this is going the, the chap first three chapters to understand the supreme, form a conception of the supreme in relation to matter, seeing God within nature, pantheism, see God within nature, he God's within nature, and see God within nature, and then the universal form, you know, the, he, the form of nature, the form that God manifests, and see the form that God manifests is his universal form. Then chapter two, leaving that behind and maturing to the stage of within the forms of this world, myself included, the body is the soul, the supreme soul, Paramatma. And there's a whole discussion on that process of Paramatma and Paramatma realization. And then chapter three, which is this one, transitioning from Paramatma realization to seeing Bhagavan feature through the medium of devotional service. That's substantial. Why substantial? Because it's who we are. We're part of something much bigger. And that something much bigger is our very source. And all living entities are from that same source. And that same source is a person, Bhagavan. So with that Bhagavan realization, with the approach of Bhagavan through the medium of devotional service, the support is substantial because it's who we really are. The bigger picture is we're living entities, parts and parcel of that supreme living entity meant for his service. And one who takes shelter of that understanding, that's this kind of gyan, that's transcendental knowledge that has a foundation and support. Foundation and support in Bhagavan conception. And where our existence is service to the Supreme. 
before coming to Connecticut this past weekend, uh, we were, I, I was with a group of devotees, we were in central New Jersey, in Edison, New Jersey, so we had the nice temple, and we had a chopper retreat, and one of the co-presenters was Shama Sundar Prabhu from Texas, and he, every, he made a gift to give to everybody, a pink one and a white one or something like that, and it says, I belong to Krishna. To remind ourselves, I belong to Krishna. The soul, the body, etc., whatever, you know, your thoughts, you know, the mind, the subtle body, gross body, and the soul belongs to Krishna. It's, we're, we're Krishna's. So since we're Krishna's, then we're meant for serving Krishna. The part is meant to serve the whole. The part that's disconnected from the whole is dysfunctional. Let's say an automobile part. It's useful if you need a alternator or generator or brake pedal or something, spark plug. But just on its own, it doesn't do anything. To disconnect the part from the whole, it is not functional. Connect the part to the whole, zoom, zoom, zoom. It's very functional. It can, you, you, you may spend a lot of money for, you know, if your finger gets cut from your body and you put your finger back on your body because it's part of the body. It's meant for serving the whole. Just lying off on the, on the sidewalk somewhere, it's yuck, a disconnected part, body part. You know, connected to the whole is, is meaningful, it's, it's substantial. It's, it, ha it has its real worth, connected to the whole. We have our real merit. That, and, and bhakti is to live one's life that way. And when one lives one's life that way, the, back to the, the verse here this morning, is there's transcendental knowledge. Vasudeva Bhagavati, you know the verse? Bhakti Yoga Prayojataha Janiyati Ashu Vairagyam Jnanam Chaya Dahaitukam Canto 1, Chapter 2. Yeah, there, there's this description that through Vasudeva Bhagavati, Bhakti Yoga. When Bhakti Yoga is performed in relation to Vasudev, that's Krishna. Vasudev Bhagavati, Bhakti Yoga Prayojataha. When you engage in Bhakti Yoga unto Vasudev, two things happen. It's the same as this verse. The two things that happen is causelessly, Ahaituki. Hetu means cause. And ahitu means no cause. Causelessly, two things. Knowledge and detachment, jnana and vairagya, arise. What's, that, what's this verse is saying? So, transcendental knowledge in relation with the Supreme Lord Hari is knowledge resulting in the complete suspension of the waves and whirlpools of the material modes. So it's, it's a byproduct of bhakti that the influence of the material modes subsides. It's a principle of any of the yoga practices. I've grown to like it's the initial verses of Patanjali Yoga Sutras. And one of those verses in Patanjali Yoga Sutras, he, he gives a definition of what is yoga. Nice, very simple. Same as what's here. Um, chitta vritti, nivritta. Chitta, chitta can mean different things. Consciousness, in this case specifically, it's the mind because he's describing the importance of yoga controlling the mind. What's yoga without controlling the mind? It's mush, it's not yoga. So, Chitta vritti, vritti means the swirling of 
the waves of the sea, the metaphor is used in related verses, swirling of the waves of the sea. So the swirling of the waves of the mind, nivriti. Yoga means that by which the swirling of the waves of the mind becomes subsided or calm. And that the swirling has everything to do with the modes of nature. The mind is just fine. However, the mind in contact with the modes of nature gets agitated, depending on the circumstance. So you, you can try to be calm by numbing yourself or you can try to be calm by going higher in the mode of goodness, but they're all unstable. And the waves resume. And, and one of the teachings of Patanjali in that sutra is the purpose of that diminishing or nivriti, diminishing the chitta vritti, the swirlings of the mind, the waves of the, of the mind, is to be able to look deep within the sea and perceive the self. So the self is not perceivable when the mind is in, in a turbulent state. It's common sense. When, it, when the sea is very calm, you can look deep within the water and see something at the bottom. And when it's swirling, you can't. So how do you get the mind calm? That's yoga. By definition, yoga is that which calms the mind. And then one can perceive the self. So the goal is self-perception. And then there's different yoga systems. This verse is describing the bhakti yoga system where the modes of nature, the swirling feature, subside. Complete suspension. Gur Gu normi, guru urmi, chakram. Chakra means wheel or the, the churning of the waves of the material modes. Prati nivrita. Prati nivrita. Nivrita we know means stop. Prati means almost completely. Prati nivrita or suspend. Now that can be temporary, suspend can be temporary, then you turn the switch on and again it's turbulent. But by continuous bhakti, why continuous? Because it's the nature of the soul. It's who we are. We're part of the Supreme and we just continue being consciously part of the Supreme using whatever endowments have been given to us by the Supreme, you have the mind and the intelligence and the body and words and resources connected to the body and our mind and our words. And we, from the soul, continuously engage in activities of devotional service. The waves of the material modes of nature subside or here, complete suspension. Pratini Vritta. That's the byproduct of transcendental knowledge. Transcendental knowledge is a byproduct of bhakti. So it's like dominoes, cause and effect. How to get bhakti? So that's a nice question. It's part of the chapter. Now, more about this transcendental knowledge that's, that brings complete suspension of the waves of material nature, such knowledge is self-satisfying. Self-satisfying. Atma prasada. Atma prasada is the first word in the second line. Atma, prasada. We know what prasada is. And then there's atma prasada. So it's nourishment of, of the atma or self-satisfied. 
the it's same concept as Bhagavad Gita or teaching. When when there's self satisfaction, one isn't in the position of feeling I want, I want, I want, because I'm self satisfied. Would you like some more puris? You like some more halava? You like some more sabji? You like some more? I'm satisfied. Thank you. When that self is satisfied, there's not some want of something you don't have. Supposing you don't have more halava, more puris, more sabji. It's okay. It's okay. And thus, it's just within the, the purport that the, 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 the satisfaction of the self that's a, a byproduct of transcendental knowledge, which is a byproduct of devotional service, is one's interest in material stuff and accumulation of stuff and being the enjoyer of that stuff, which is called marketing, it's not so important. You know, we're, we're, spiritual life is not really good for gross national product because you have to have consumerism because if people don't consume then where's the economy uh, how people can you know advance their business interests if people don't consume Then that people may start producing things that are useful for devotional service. Art, music, that's not just for stimulating the senses or architecture or you know, et cetera, et cetera. Like the question yesterday about household life. You things that are needed for household life. So furniture and you know stuff but in relation to that which is pleasing to Krishna. That's this desirelessness that we heard about yesterday. Not having a desire separate from Krishna's interest, but having the interest of Krishna and the satisfaction of Krishna in one's own interest. That's desirelessness. That's good marketing for spiritual well-being. Now, now getting there is another story, but... Devotional service is the means, and as one cultivates the means, then the result, that's transcendental knowledge, and with that comes jnana, comes vairagya. So if you don't want vairagya, then don't develop jnana, because if you develop jnana, there comes vairagya. And vairagya doesn't mean chuck it, it just means I'm not attached to the sense of deriving happiness from the senses meeting sense object. Really? What's that like? It's senses meet sense object for the purpose of satisfying Krishna. Because the senses and the sense object and me were Krishna's. I belong to Krishna. And that's that's our life. That's a life of devotion. And he goes on in the purport, and from that preliminary knowledge and detachment comes a further maturing of our realization of our true spiritual identity and our true spiritual relationship with the eternal supreme soul, our spiritual form and our spiritual rasa with that spiritual form. It's just part of the teachings of bhakti. And it, you know, it may take a while to get there, but it's that's where the train is going. Then come these terms, Kaivalya, and he's he, Prabhupada has woven a few different applications or definitions of the term Kaivalya. We'll do it again. The word for word, kaivalya, in the word for word is transcendental. In the purport, kaivalya is the only means to achieve God realization or 
either using interchangeably bhakti yoga with kaivalya. For example, that this term, it's, I spent a little bit of time with the term. Shankaracharya's teaching was characterized by history as kevala advaita. Kevala advaita, absolute monism. Advaita, monism. Kevala advaita, absolute monism. And then there's kevala bhakti. Absolute bhakti. Squeaky clean, nothing else but. So, those are it's the same word, Sanskrit word, but the application is different according to the situation. So here, referring to our previous acharyas, Jiva Goswami in particular, he's given a Vedic version, Eko Narayano Deva. Paravaranam param aste kaivalya sangitaha. What's that? Narayan, the personality of Godhead, is known as kaivalya, and the means. So that's the, the the means and the object are both connected with the word kaivalya. Devotional service, kaivalya. The object, kaivalya because they're on the absolute platform. That's transcendental. A simple synthesis of different applications. Transcendental. And when one is on this Kaivalya platform and is approaching the Kaivalya Narayana, this is called Kaivalya Pantha, the path of Kaivalya. Kaivalya Pantha, that begins with Shravana which is what we're doing right now. Shavana Kirtana, or Harikata, or Bhagavad Kata. It's the process of Kaivalya Pantha. And what's the result? Stimulate, two things, purification and stimulation. Purification of the tendency for the mind to be agitated by material modes of nature, an awakening of the real identity of the soul. Two things. Very simple, very standard, easy to understand. <laughs> Cleansing and awakening. Just hearing Harikata. And then as that awakening takes place, that's awakening of who I really am, that's devotional service, then comes transcendental knowledge, and with transcendental knowledge comes all these nice, other nice things. Diminishing of, bringing to the point of suspension of the modes of nature. Detachment from mundane topics, social and political, etc., etc., etc. And he calls this, he's almost done with the purport, Prati, Nivrita gunormi. Same. Gunormi. The, the, the urmi, the waves of the gunas. Gunormi. Prati nivrita, almost completely suspended, finished. And when that happens, there's a satisfaction or atma prasad. So one isn't going to have, we may be hankering for satisfaction. They have songs about it. <laughs> Pardon me. You know, I grew up a, during a generation where pop rock music was very popular. One of the popular Rolling Stones songs is Can't Get No Satisfaction. <laughs> Can't get no satisfaction. It's honest. Can't get no satisfaction. Can you get satisfaction? Yeah. Pratini Vritta Gurnormi. <laughs> Hear Harikata. No. Oh. Gotta hear rock music. But when there, there's a, a, a loss of attraction for those kinds of 
the sound vibrations and the messages conveyed through those sound vibrations. Sound conveys ideas of things. Hearing the sound of transcendence brings transcendence. Realization of transcendence. And you know, turn the light on, the darkness is dispelled. Finally, Srila Rupa Goswami has described this action of a pure devotee as Nirbanda Krishna Sambande Yukta Vairagya Uchate, which means y Yukta Vairagya. The vairagya, there's the Vairagya word again. Gan Vairagya, and this is Yukta Vairagya. Detachment arises in bhakti by things in relation to Hari, you use them in service to Hari. So there's a, a nice mechanical thing, a nice camera. I know the you know, sound system and microphone and nice house and heating because it's cold outside. And so using things that are of this world in service to the Supreme, not just so I'm more comfortable or I can do more stuff, but in the consciousness purposefully trying to satisfy the Supreme Lord. Then the waves and the whirlpools can subside. And then we can see the self and all these other nice things that come from bhakti, the transcendental knowledge that dispels the disturbing elements of material existence. Even we're in the material atmosphere. That's this yukta vairagya as opposed to jnana vairagya. Speculative knowledge that doesn't have a substantial support. Bhagavatam is so nice. <laughs> so nice. The whole world should have the Srimad Bhagavatam. At least some people. And then those some people can live it and model it. And that's nice too. So let's see if there's some discussion. Guru maybe first one is more of a comment. Um, you know, this um, topic of jnanam and bhakti, like growing up uh, in India, I remember um, the prevalent view or worldview that was being propagated in those days, perhaps even now is, you know, bhakti is for sentimentalists, right? right? And it's for people who are less intelligent, yeah. you know, they weak minded, weak minded and so on and so forth. And I always used to wonder, that didn't make a lot of sense, um, because it seemed so natural when, you know, visiting temples or deity worship or just kirtans and so on. Um, but when I came across Srila Prabhupada's books, you know, this understanding of the principle of love has to be superior to principle of knowledge became very apparent and very clear. Nice way to express it too. And so, but I, I can still see you know, uh, perhaps me and others who were, I don't want to say necessarily brainwashed. It wasn't, I don't want to judge that it was active brainwashing or anything like that. But but the those, you know, impressions are still difficult to, you know, give up, mm. right? And and focus, focus like on this verse or the Vasudeva Bhagavati verse that you quoted. It's 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 challenging to to focus on bhakti instead of trying to bring our intellect to understand God, versus seeking God through loving devotional service. It's 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 hard still for most of us. So, do you have any uh, advice on where we might start to give up some of that baggage? Could you say that phrase again? Love is stronger than knowledge. 
Do not, do not, or something like that? The principle of love has to be strong, superior to principle of knowledge. Okay. Okay. Because, because one who is in knowledge has love, and one who doesn't have love doesn't have knowledge. Something's missing. Knowledge without love is not what real knowledge is. So, love must be superior to knowledge. Nice. A practical consideration, your, your question is where, where to begin or how to help further the um, elimination of that concept or judgment. You know, the judgment can go both ways. The judgment by the intellectuals poo-pooing those who are practitioners of bhakti or those who are practicing bhakti poo-pooing those who are pr practitioners of cultivation of knowledge. You know, finger pointing and blaming work both ways. <clears throat> On a practical level, uh, it, it, having literature and or <clears throat> the association of those who are very knowledgeable devotees may be the best medicine. I, mean, I know that it, that's how it is. I, I didn't grow up in India when you did. I certainly heard the poo-poo about, you know, bhakti is for sentimentalists and people just weak-minded. And Because we, the brahmanas, we study Vedanta, we study the Upanishads, and we chant the mantras, and we have strong intellect, and those silly people over there. It's kind of like the, the discussion with Shank Prakash and under Saraswati and Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. You're just, you know, you're behaving like a sentimentalist, but you're a sannyasi. And sannyasis do this, they don't do that. So why are you doing that? Thinking you're the superior. So why are you doing the inferior when you're supposed to be doing the superior. You're Brahmana Sannyasi. Don't do these sentimental things. That's down there instead of up here. You know, the, the devotion itself is persuasive. The knowledge, I mean, something that worked both for Prakashan of Saraswati and Sarvabhuma Bhattacharya, who are like super scholars, was simplicity, humility, and the display of knowledge. That's a superior knowledge. Sarvabhuma Bhattacharya hearing from Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, I've never heard this description of Vinata Sutra like this. This is amazing. And because he was honest, I was listening to a room conversation with Prabhupada recently, and he was saying the, 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 the merit of Sarvabhuma Bhattacharya was that when he heard the truth, he accepted it. No, so you know, many people hearing the truth, they just want to argue and argue and ad infinitum argue, and, and Prabhupada was advising, don't waste your time. Find pe people, you know, so there's a, you see, how, your question, back to your question, how to begin the process of helping somebody that has a, the holier than thou or more elevated than thou because you're a sentimentalist if you do bhakti idea, you know, towards, even t towards oneself, having bought into that perception of that's, that's really where things are. So don't do this soft thing do the hard thing cultivate knowledge cultivate knowledge of devotion in the association of those who have have vast knowledge or 
associate with those that may not have advanced knowledge, but their realization are very, is very profound. And truth shines through darkness. Without mentioning names, uh, there's a young sannyasi who is brilliant. And he presents very elevated topics in a very simple way that illustrates it and explains it without so much Sanskrit quotation, etc., etc. But he has a lot of realization. Or like, you know, that's compelling. This is a wise person. Young, not vastly learned in terms of Sanskrit texts and quoting Sanskrit texts and, you know, Shastra to support any, any statement. He may have it, may not have it. That isn't his approach. He speaks very wisely. Or like what we're doing in the evenings, here in Queen Kunti, she speaks of herself in a very simple way, but she has you know, profound realization. And anyone that's honest that hears what she says, like, wow. And she's not because she's vastly learned, scholarly, intellectual. She's mother and understands things the way she, as a pure devotee, understands things. So hear from the, the, so the conclusion, hear from those that have very practical realizations of truth, whether it's coming from the scriptural, like Jiva Goswami or Bhakti Siddhanta or luminaries like that, Vishwana Chakravarti Thakur, Rupa Goswami. Of course, they're carrying Bhakti Shakti, but they have vast grasp of scripture and the conclusions of scripture. So that that can help. Look, the bhakti path has such luminaries. I'm not leaving myself in the dark by following behind such luminaries. And then gradually, gradually, as the light goes on, then they can see that that's the best path. And the other is something's missing. Next. Yeah, um, my second question is uh, related to this um, trend that we are seeing today regarding artificial intelligence, you know. There's people, so many trends today. People, <laughs> people are talking about you know, it could open up a lot of opportunities or it could also be even an existential threat threat to humanity and all that. But I want to bring it a little bit closer to home. You know, I have, uh, you know, Mayank here, Sadhguru, you know, we became close because our kids are learning yeah. how to um, use robotics and some of these newer technologies. Mm -hmm. as they're growing up. So they're definitely in a very different world growing up yeah. than we used to be. Oof. But I think it comes with both risk and reward. But I would, I would love to... Um, my, my question is, how can we teach our kids? You it's know, the Yukta Vairagya principle, principle that yeah. who's, who's the enjoyer? The, the, the intellect and the mind can, can be you know, activated like anything and get wired into a new, you know, virtual reality. And that's reality. But where's the train going? What's the purpose? So it starts on the bhakti principle and that then it's yukta vairagya. Then it's, not, then it's vairagya yukta, not just vairagya, not just yukta. Learning something, learning something, learning something. And you got a whole other reality going on or the whole other set of values going on where there isn't a foundation. No harm. But when there's a proper foundation, major harm. 
And it's not, the train isn't going to stop. It's going to keep moving. No, I can say, I don't want to get on that train. I don't want to get on that train. I don't want to learn about, I don't want to learn about technology. Thank you. I mean, I can ask somebody to set up the system, but I don't want to learn the system. just don't have the, the aptitude for it. But to those that know how to do it, the, 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 there's the reward and there's the risk, and the, the, as you mentioned. And the risk is minimized by the, the purpose for which the yukta is engaged. Yukta for whom? It can be one's own gratification, I know how to do this and that and the other thing. And, I'm smarter than the next guy and I'm going to get rewards because I, I'm smarter than the next guy and all of those forgetful of Krishna opportunities. Doors are opened like anything for forgetfulness. It's the principle of making choices based upon what? It's just satisfying the mind and senses that there's there's red flags all over the place. But then just shutting it down is there's red flags all over the place. So one can do something else without that and and be content. Like, you know, for example, the simple living height thinking theme that Prabhupada propagated. He propagated Yukta Vairagya, but he also propagated simple living high thinking. Where, you know, off the grid and da 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 I mean, there's, here's, for example, for example, there's two places that, that I know of that are off the grid, literally. One is at New Vrajadam, and the other is Echo Village in Bombay, you know, the Chopati project and uh, Shivra Maharaj's project in Hungary. As far as I know, they don't have electricity. If you don't have electricity, you don't have Wi-Fi, you don't have lots of stuff. So I don't know what they do because Shivra Maharaj's, you know, has internet connection. And he uses can you know technology to to produce his books and technology, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't know how they fit the two together. Maybe they do that in Budapest and they don't do that at the farm. I don't know how they do it. I've never been there. But there's merit. And he you know speaks a lot about Varnashram and the simple living and you know et cetera. And yet he's using technology, so he can move as Prabhupada could do easily between the two worlds and be comfortable in both worlds and not feel uncomfortable in either of them. So the, the risk is, the antidote for the risk or the, that which will help minimize the, the unwanted part of the, on the risk realm is strong foundation. So who is this for? And that's not easy. You know, do with or do without, it's not easy. But it's the foundation. Yeah, this is like a common one. You talked, I mean, we discussed about uh, how to reach God, how to get thinking God with all the spirals. But nowadays, whenever we think about, even though we do yoga and then we concentrate on meditation, always the spiral comes in. Always what? The spiral comes in. We're not able to concentrate clearly on the God. The swirling of the waves. The swirling okay, of the waves. Okay, okay. Chitavriti. Yeah. So, how to, even though we meditate, we do yoga, concentrate more, still the swirls are coming and we are not clear. We are our... Things well, two things. I'll, I'll offer two things. 
this young man over here was very kind and he helped me create a presentation on mysteries of sound. And by the way, I wanted to mention to you, I've made that presentation maybe 50 times. Different audiences. I mean, the structure of it came from Banu Swami, but he filled in a bunch. And it's really nice. So one answer to your question is sound. Sound meditation is many, many, many times more effective than without sound. And there's different sounds, and it can be the Buddhist sound of a gong. <clears throat> sound helps. But then the transcendental sound. And transcendental sound is a place of shelter. So even with place of shelter, with transcendental sound, it takes practice. Why practice? We're very conditioned. And the mind is swirling. And even if you can make it peaceful for a little while, there it goes again. So practice. Practice with something that's authorized and by practice authorized, it becomes effective and slowly, slowly. We just had a Japa retreat on this topic. I used it at the Japa retreat on Friday night. Sound. And slowly, slowly. Bhakti Siddhanta's phrase is these coverings, the forgetfulness swirling coverings, become effaced by sound. Effaced. Nice word. Diminished gradually and gone. Diminished, then gone. Same as this verse. But through sound, so the same as in the purport, begin with Shravana. So how long will it take? How long it takes is how long it'll take. But if you follow a path that'll get you to the destination, just keep following the path with faith. It'll get you to the destination. And then the more at attentive attention is, is, is essential in meditation. And here's a little one. Behind attention is intention. It's cute. But intention means free volition, free will. So what do you want? When you do meditation, what do you want? And if you want something material, like a mind that's peaceful and not caught up in complexities, that's material. What's spiritual intention? Our, make our relationship with the source of everything real and vital and vibrant. My my I want to I want my real real self to be connected to the real real source of everything. That's bhakti. And that's 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 more powerful than other types of meditation. The intention drives the attention to what? No, what's the target? Is it about me and my I'm feeling this and that? Or is it about my in a relationship where it's all about the happiness of the source of everything. That's bhakti. So the intention t combined with sound in simple language. And then how do you get that? Association of those that have it. Sadhu Sangha. So I'll say it again. It's really simple language, just like summation of all of that. Meditation where you can stay not just up and then down and then up and down and up and down, but stay. It's sound with the intention of connecting with the source of everything for their pleasure, for the, for the Bhagavan's pleasure in, in association of those who are doing the same, sadhu sangha. Then you can get there and stay there. It's gradual, but it's a, it's a cultivation. And it's effective. There's a couple questions online. Okay, and then we're going to end. 
This question is from Krishna Priya Mataji. Really? She's online. She had to be at school. Oh. The previous verse discussed how one should worship Krishna if seeking advancement in knowledge, and this verse defined what happens as after effect of having transcendental knowledge. Very good. But we are not trained to pray for more knowledge. And in fact, just that tendency to seek more knowledge without practical application and realization can be detrimental. Yes. How do we teach students to go beyond as seekers of knowledge? By, by the, uh, similar question to your husband's question, when you have the risk reward. It's, you know, the, 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 how can we help is the bhakti principle. For, for whom is this knowledge meant? Knowledge for knowledge's sake is a fool's paradise. It's not seeking knowledge, it's seeking bhakti, the pleasure of Krishna, and with that comes knowledge, that kind of knowledge. Thus we should help uh, others to strive for. Next. This is from Amara Devi Dasi. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Our goal is to achieve Krishna Prema. How should we be discriminant in choosing services such that they help achieve this goal? Since all temple services are Krishna services, is time and, compa and comp capacity the only consideration or should we consider something else too? Well, it's not, the, let me just, I'm, I'm, my mind was stuck on the question. The framing of the question is, our goal is not per se Krishna Prema. I mean, it depends what, how you think of Krishna Prema, but Krishna Prema may be, you know, a happiness that I experience and I want that happiness. So the, the goal is being in our relationship with Krishna where, <laughs> just like yesterday's verse, Amar, go, go back and read the purport of yesterday's verse and you'll find Jiva Goswami's definition of desirelessness and that's what our goal is purity, where the happiness of Krishna is our happiness. And if you want to call that Krishna Prema, that's fine, but it's it, generally the connotation of Krishna Prema is what my experience is, not what Krishna's experience is. So you're, you're, the, frame, the, the essence of your question is how to make decisions when there's so many things that are beneficial to achieve Krishna's happiness. What well, it's um, three things: the introspect. What is going to be, from my experience, and I monitor it as I go along. What helps me orient my heart towards that purpose more? Not what makes me happier, per se, or you know, explicitly what. It, 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 what makes the sense of, of I am an instrument of Krishna's happiness stronger? And that's, that's, that's introspection exercise. And then a second is those that know you well. So those that know you well can help you select from the menu of options. This is going to be beneficial for you. You know, customized guidance. And then a third is just your overall knowledge of the scripture. And there, that's an unending quest. It's not, now back to Krishna Priya's question, it's not just uh, acquiring knowledge. Reading scripture means acquire knowledge and more knowledge and more knowledge. But reading scripture means becoming more and more familiar with the revealed sense of what that mood of pleasing Krishna is like. And there's different, different, different persons and different, different varieties. But what's that realm of what's it like? Because we're not accustomed to that. So that this third answer goes back to the first answer, introspection. So those three things. As you know, those are standards by which you can select the right options of the menu of many possibilities. 
services. Here she is, princess. That's it. She the Prabhupada Kizai.